testing. All right, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Can persons hear? Yes, we're hearing. All right, so we just want to welcome everyone to join the wave. All right, so we're gonna start exactly at two. We're just waiting for a few more persons to join the meeting. Welcome, welcome Kashma.
All right, can persons hear me? Yes, can we can hear you. Your thumbs up. All right, I see there are a number of persons here from England. We have persons all across Jamaica. We have schools here online. We have our colleagues. So we just want to give us a, a warm welcome from Jamaica. We are the Natural History Museum of Jamaica, a division of the Institute of Jamaica. And we're very pleased to be commemorating World Wetlands Day. As you can maybe hear in my background, there's a lot of water in the form of rain. So it's, it's, it's a wet day and very topical because our topic, our global topic is water and wetlands. And without further ado, we are going to go right into our introductory video. Just want everyone to sit back, relax. We want to have fun while learning about our wetlands. Welcome to Join the Wave, a wetlands awareness and virtual engagement brought to you by the Natural History Museum of Jamaica. Experience 40 minutes of virtual immersion of the wetlands. This is the first of four wetlands webinars. Join us each Tuesday in the month of February you'll enjoy online presentations, wetland themed online games, wetland key term features, wetland stories and tours. Join the wave, all about wetlands and water, as we celebrate World Wetlands Day 2021 with a difference. So, what are you waiting for? Let's go. Sometimes they're wet, sometimes they're not. Transition zones where the water meets the dry spots They call them marshy swamps Wetland life is really the best Migrating birds stop here to nest it's a restaurant and a farm. So, what are you waiting for? Let's go. Sometimes we're wet, sometimes they're Transition zones where the water meets the dry spots They call them marshy swamps Wetland life is really the best Migrating birds stop here to nest it's a restaurant and a fine hotel It's a habitat that serves life well There are wetlands the whole world round In every continent and country wetlands can be found They're the link between water and land Hold on to a wetlands, let a wetlands stand They're the link between water and land Hold on to a wetlands, let a wetlands stand 
There are wetlands inland and out by the sea There's a marsh, a swamp, and an estuary There's an oxbow lake and a vernal pool too A bottomland, a bog, a fen, and a slough There are many names for wetlands it's plain to see they have one thing in common, it's hydrology. They're the link between water and land. Hold on to a wetlands, let a wetlands stand. They're the link between water and land. Hold on to a wetlands, let a wetlands stand. If the water table's high or the water table's low It soaks it up like a sponge or it lets it go It's like a water filter so the water will be Reduced in pollution and silt free Wetlands aren't wasteland as some have said they're a vital part of our watershed They're the link between water and land Hold on to a wetlands, let a wetlands stand They're the link between water and land Hold on to a wetlands, let a wetlands stand our wetlands disappear each year, the dredge drained and filled For housing tracks or parking lots or new farms to be tilled More than before we know for sure, the more than mud and sand Hold on to a wetlands, let a wetlands stand when you go to the wetlands, get down low Put your feet in the mud, let it ooze between your toes Stand real still All right, did we enjoy that virtual tour at the end? Does anybody know where that was located? Where was that shot? Looks familiar to anyone? You can type it to the chat or you can raise your hand and indicate so that the host can unmute you. Not sure? All right, I'll give you a clue. It's a, it was shot at the National Focal point for World Wetlands Day in Jamaica this year. All right, so we have, we have someone who is on the ball, Peter Hardy, very good, and Bernadette Champentier, Port Royal, yes, indeed. That was shot in Port Royal, Palisados. And that's an extensive wetland area, and it is actually one of our Ramsar sites of international importance. And so we're just going to continue on. Just want persons to just type in the chat where you're from so that we can acknowledge you. All right, so we have Alison Pierce from Negril, Jamaica. Earlier we had someone from Cold, cold England. All right, so Bernadette is from Ottawa, Canada. Stimson is from Kingston. Peter Harding from Kingston. We have Melissa from Clarendon. Quite a few persons from Kingston. We have Rhoda Price from Clarendon. All right, we have Saint Thom we have Miss Thomas from Mandeville. It's good to have everyone here. And so we're just going to continue in our program now. But before we do, we ask persons to join the wave. And 
We want to know, does anybody know what it stands for? The acronym that we'll coin. You can type it in the chat or you can indicate and unmute. All right. WAVE actually stands for Wetlands Awareness and Virtual Engagements. And this is the first of four sessions. And so we'll be taking persons on a journey each week on a Tuesday of each week of February, and we'll be looking at wetlands in depth. And so this is just the first of four. And so that's why it's called the wave. All right. So we're going to go into a little icebreaker wetland theme game. And at this time, I'm just going to ask one of our colleagues, Miss Tiona Famo. She is the museum's program officer of the Natural History Museum of Jamaica to just prepare herself as she brings us into a wetland themed game. Are you ready, Tiona? All right, I'm just gonna bring it up on the screen for us to see. All right, ready when you are, Tuna. You know? Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So welcome to our first Wetland Series webinar. So before we go further with the presentations, we're going to have our icebreaker challenge. And today we'll be doing a wetland and water word search puzzle. So there are a few rules, but first I, would, I need five persons to participate. So the first five persons to indicate by raising their hands will be a part of the icebreaker challenge. I will. All right, so we have Janice, Sharonia, um, Stimson, all right, so the rule of the game is you're going to use the rule number <laughs> You're going to use the row numbers 
and the column numbers to find the words. So for example, if I'm looking for the word surface water, right? And if it's in row one, I would say number one, that's R1. If it was in row 12, if it was type was in column 12, I would say C12. So you can write your answers in the chat and the person who finds the most word will get a prize. So you have one minute to find the word. And I'll let you know when your minute has started. All right, you guys may begin. So remember to type your answers in the chat. We also have persons on YouTube participating. All right, so Britton is on and Sharonia is on. Let's see the other answers, guys. So I'm giving you an extra minute. And in case Shama also finding words, Allison, I keep it going, guys. So, so far we find watershed, groundwater, surface water, pollutant, fresh water. Which row though are column? Recharge. Aquifer, nice. <laughs> All right. Our final minute, guys. Run off. All right, so watershed. So we're almost finished. Wetland. Right, so I believe we found all work. All right, so I'm going to go through the chat and decide the winner. Thanks for participating, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you, Tiona, for bringing us through that icebreaker. All right, so we have quite a few things lined up for everyone here. All right, thanks, Michaela Ellis. All right. So we want to welcome also those joining us on YouTube. 
And uh, we are now at the stage where we're going into our introductory video just before our keynote presenter. So we have a special guest that is with us today who is an expert in wetlands and mangrove ecosystems. But just before we put our guest speaker on, we are going to be going into our introductory video, which we have prepared. We went onto the streets, we went into our wetland areas, and we focused on some of our fisher folk who have direct interest in the wetlands. They make their living from the wetlands. They are, it's a very vital part of their own livelihood. And so we just wanted to capture from them their own perspectives of the wetlands. And so we have a Voice of the People production. So let's just hold on as we bring that up. Are persons able to see? Not yet. Not yet. What are wetlands? I really don't know what is wetlands, but I, I don't know. It has something to do with water. I don't know. I don't. The mangroves, refuge key, they, you know, the, the mangroves on the wall. Wetlands, uh, you know, maybe the swamp, you talk about those like the swamp? Yeah. Swamps, the mangroves, the beach area, and the wetlands. Swamp. Well, wetlands supposed to mean like beaches, swamps, seas. Am I accurate? After the sea, the water goes, then the, the place is very swampy. Wetlands are really natural, natural, natural. Um, wetlands are just natural things for mangroves and other livelihood. Wetlands is important. It's just a natural place for livelihood for crabs, soldier crabs that the birds feed on, that is the, um, the crane and the other birds. And you have like the, the, the land crab where people eat seasonal. Every season that crab comes out of the wetlands and whatever people catch them, hustle for them, that they are hustling to other people too. Whenever crab is on, everybody hustle. So the wetlands is good. You understand? Yeah. So we heard from a bit of our fisher folk. All right, I see some hands that are raised. There's Sharon Stimson. Go ahead, Sharon. Are you able to unmute? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I just wondering if they're all from Port Royal, those who you interviewed. Okay, so we had a caption at the bottom. Actually, it's two locations that we had um, we had visited. So the first three persons were from the Port Royal area, and the last 
two or th last three were from the St. Catherine area that's at the Dyke Fishing Village in St. Okay, Catherine. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Yes, I see a hand, Janice Cunningham. Okay, okay love you, man. Pardon me? Tell me, Phillips, I'm, I'm calling her. Please, I'm not her to come here a bit. Thanks, love. Okay, you want Sharon Stimson to call you? What? All right. All right, so we are going to go into our main presentation for this afternoon. And I just want to thank everyone for continuing with us. You know, we are going to go straight now into our key note presentation, but just a little bit about our key presenter. I get I got the idea that Camilo French. Mm -hmm. And we are very happy to have him. We just want to welcome him on our platform. Can we have the sub major minimum plan? Minimum plan to minimize the dynamics. Sorry about that. Here to do it. Sorry about that. 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 Sorry about that working as a marine ecologist. So he, he has a wealth of information about the wetlands. He has published over 10 publications, 50 technical reports, and he currently is a distinguished lecturer at the UWE, University of the West Indies, and he wears many hats. He is also the safety director for the island's only hyperbaric treatment facility, which is at the Discovery Bay Marine Lab. And he is also an instructor in basic life support and a paddy open water scuba instructor. And so without further ado, I'm going to make you a co-host, Dr. Trench, so that you can share with us what you have for this afternoon. Are you able to share your screen? Yes, good afternoon. And thank you very much colleagues from the IOJ. Let me try to share my screen now. Yes. Just before you, you, you con Dr. Trench, I just want to ask persons to have your questions ready. And at the end, we will have a question and answer segment. So you can post your questions after the presentation or indicate by a raised hand and we will facilitate your questions. You may go ahead. Yes, thank you very much and welcome everyone. Happy World Wetlands Day to you all. Today is a great day for us to celebrate our wetlands. So despite whatever else is happening in the world, the wetlands are consistent and they keep on doing the great services for us. So let me just tell you a little bit about what I know about wetlands. I've been looking at wetlands quite a number of years. Um, now that you say so many years, it's kind of shocking, but it is what it is. So the theme for this year, World Wetlands Day, is inseparable water, wetlands, and life, and really, they are, right? So they have a nice graphic here provided by um, Ramsar. So thank you again to the, my colleagues at the Natural History Museum of um, the IOJ. Thank you for inviting me. And um, of course, I am a staff member of the University of the West Indies. And um, special thanks to the Forest Conservation Fund and the EFG because a lot of the work that I have done through the years has been through their um, grants and um, support. So let's get into it because I don't want to bore you guys all day. So what are wetlands? Wetland is any land that is covered by water, inundated by water, and this can be permanent or temporary. Even man-made wetland systems are still um, considered as wetlands. So in Jamaica, we have quite a few. We have swans, ponds, lakes, 
um, persons call them by different names, marshes, etc. So we tend to call um, wetland areas um, swamps, but the names are based on the type of vegetation there. So for example, mangrove forest is trees, while a swamp is technically a wetland without large trees. So, and, they, and this can go on and on. In terms of the Ramsar definition, it's a lot longer. But you can see that it is areas of land not exceeding six meters. So even um, some sections of coral reefs may be considered as wetlands because they are shallow areas of land which are covered by sea, mostly um, permanently, but some just for a high tide time during the day. So of course, we are here to celebrate wetlands on February 2nd, because this is the day that the Ramsar Convention was really created. And it's, the, it's a convention to look at or to protect wetlands of international importance. Jamaica has four such Ramsar sites. And I would welcome the students in the chat group to just type in the text and we'll see at the end. What are the four Ram sites, Ramsar sites in Jamaica? Let me see how knowledgeable you are. All right, so the type of wetland I'll speak to you about today, which is an area that I specialize in, is mangroves. So mangroves or mangrove forests or mangal as persons call them, they are basically flowering plants which dominate tropical shorelines and the sheltered intertidal zones. Now, the reason why they dominate the shoreline isn't because they are the only plant that can live in um, water but there are some of the few plants that can tolerate salt water. Good. So the third line, you see that they are facultative halophytes. That means that they do not need salt water to survive, but they have the ability to deal with salt water. Either they excrete the salt water or they reduce the salt water intake in different ways. Other adaptations they have, so they adapt to the harsh environment. They have spongy rooting systems. They have lengthy cells, which are tiny holes on the roots and the plants to give them additional um, here, they have what we call viviparous seedlings, meaning the seedlings are germinated before they leave the parent, uh, well, well, while they're still on the parent, and they can leave the, the parent tree as seedlings, not seeds, because they already developed, so they have very rapid germination. Um, there are over 50 species worldwide, but bear in mind, we have three true species in Jamaica. In many of the books and so on, you see that we have four species. So... We have the red mangrove, black mangrove, and white mangrove, um, all named because of different colors that they have either on the trunk or behind the roots. The button mangrove or the buttonwood is not a, a precisely true mangrove. It's what called a mangrove associate or a mangrove or a minor mangrove because the button mangrove does not germinate in salt water and the seedling, the seeds are dispersed by wind um, um, dispersal, not um, salt water. They cannot survive in salt water seeds. Even though when they're larger, they connect in salt water. They um, survive in salt water. And here we have a couple of pictures of different types of mangroves. And the picture in the middle there is the lenticels on the, on the mangrove tree root. So they are alluvial wetlands, meaning they thrive mainly on the floodplains with the silt. We have about 9,700 hectares in the 10,000 range in Jamaica. Um, we have about less than 1% of them are protected, sadly. But they are found in all parishes and the greatest amount is found in um, Portland bite area. Here we have a beautiful picture of a mangrove system out in Trelawney. And here you can see the small red mangrove seedlings growing out into the water because the seedlings are easily dispersed and once the water is calm enough, they'll take root. So mangroves have over 200 documented uses. So there are places in the world that if mangroves were not there, people would starve to death. People use it to feed their animals, etc. In Jamaica, we have a lot of resources, so we don't use it as much. So we tend to do more abuse than use, sadly. So some of the main functions, um, it filters nutrients, it traps sediments, and it helps to build land. And if I go back to this picture, you can see that this area is actually building land because the mangrove trap different organic sediments around the roots, in addition to some inorganic ones like sand, etc. And over time, they grow out to the sea if the area is calm enough. It provides habitat for birds 
and many other fish, many, over hundreds of species, it's a nursery ground. Um, it breaks the wind and controls erosion. Um, many household products and food and feed for animals, fuel wood, fence posts, fish pots, and when it comes to the big box, it protects our coastlines from much of the infrastructure damage that would be um, given to us by storms, storm surges, hurricanes, etc. And you should know the story of the, even though there are hundreds of thousands of lives lost in the Boxing Day tsunami in Asia, many more were saved because of mangroves. And since then, persons have a newfound respect for mangroves and a whole lot of mangrove conservation and restoration is going on there because of the lessons we learned from um, that side of the world. So in Jamaica, the interactions with mangroves are unstoppable, they're historic and they're vital. So for example, our two major airports, when you go to the airports, look around, mangrove forests, our marinas, we have um, a lot of flood water retention, places like Port Moore, Black River, Black River, doesn't suffer from flooding because of the large wetlands, not just mangroves there, that soak up millions of gallons of water from the Black River. It filters nutrients. So if you live out in Portmore, out in Helisha, after your sewage is treated um, to secondary treatment, it actually gets polishing from the wetlands over there. It's a windbreak for many different types of ships and coastal cities and towns like Kingston, and I'll soon tell you a little bit about that. Many recreational and cultural uses, persons go on vessels to do recreation tours, people go to crab bush, bird watching, etc. And the reality is most of our coastal towns have coastal forest origins, either mangroves or beach scrub or something that has been developed. So it's very important for us to try to keep what is left as a coastal forest or a wetland if that is the case. So here's an example of Montego Bay. So this area here where you see the ecotourism, biodiversity, habitat, these are some of the services that the wetland provides for Montego Bay. Up in the hills, you see property value. Now, how is property value important? Persons up in the hills of Bogue there looking down on the wetland, on the mangrove. It's a lot more beautiful than looking down on the Montego Bay city. So they have higher property values there. And um, this is also true all over the world. I know of a community in Florida, in Naples, the community actually spent millions of dollars to rebuild a mangrove that was dying right outside of their condos because when the mangroves died, the condos weren't as attractive anymore. So the greenery is very important. And in Montego Bay, see those three red arrows there? Those are actually sources of gray water or black water or sewage that enters the mangrove. So it filters right there. And if I move to the next slide, it gives you a close-up of what it looks like. So this is the Water Commission sewage treatment plant. Um, the red arrow is sewage, not raw sewage, but you know sometimes accidents do happen. Um, there's a large drain coming down from um, what's the main tariff here through Montego Bay, Howard Cook Drive. Sewage comes in here and sewage comes outside as cleans up a lot of it. So when it enters the lagoons of Bogue the water is a little bit cleaner. And just on the outside here is where they do the rum tours and the glass bottom boat. So can you imagine if all the water from the sewage of Montego Bay was allowed to enter into the Bogue Lagoons? It would be bad, bad eutrophication for the reef there. And the reef is valued at millions of dollars because hundreds of persons or thousands of persons visit that reef throughout the year, both for recreation and for fishing. And in Falmouth, we... Bear in mind that the town of Falmouth, looking on the left here, was historically a mangrove forest. The Martha Bridge comes down to Falmouth, and these arrows indicate where the water direction flows. So it flags out all around. This is swampy wetland here. See these um, <laughs> ponds here? That was a development several years ago from the 70s. And on the, right, on the left here, this water goes into the mangrove. So what services does a mangrove play here in, in um, Not very happy about this, but it provides houses for many persons in the, in the heart of Falmouth. And I know Falmouth is a busy town center. Fisheries on the outside, accommodation from the hotels on the other side. Fisheries on the inside in the Bay of Falmouth here. 
it's a windbreak for the houses here. Um, agricultural lands right there in terms of fisheries and, and farming. And uh, ecotourism. Now I would pause to ask if anybody knows what ecotourism is happening in Falmouth. I encourage you guys to put it in the chat. Um, and in case you don't know, Falmouth has a mangrove-based ecotourism attraction, which earns more money than maybe the most beautiful coral reef in Jamaica, sadly. And that is the glistening waters or the luminous lagoon. And this, in the height of the tourist season, can attract about a thousand guests per day. We're not on boats in the luminous lagoon. There you see four of them in the water with the waters glistening around them. And if you have never done it, you should check it out. Right here in Falmouth, Trelawney, a murky little mangrove area can make, how much money that? 25,000 US dollars. And that is just what they're paying for the boat. Of course, these persons are buying drinks and buying food and paying a tour bus operator. So that mangrove area is very, very worthy of protection. And NEPA has put a tree preservation or the proposal on that area. So we should support initiatives like that because that area is worth millions of dollars to us. So just a little bit on Falmouth, but unfortunately, here we see a lot of these houses in Falmouth and the circles there show some of the new development areas. Um, it's growing towards the mangrove forest and these kind of things need to be checked. So when you have unplanned developments, the sewage treatment, the planned solid waste disposal and the culverting is all missing. And on the right there, you can see some figures that show that the, 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 um, it, the settlements in Falmouth are actually earning more actually yeah. occupying more space <laughs> than <laughs> hotels yeah. in Falmouth. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right? So the looks so it's, the it's a very looks it's a very serious matter. Um, the function looks all right. I mean so there are some wetlands in Sentan that are of um worthy of recognition as well. For example, if the, hello I'm on mute. No, I'm still hearing you. Okay. You see, and I am muted. All right. So when you pass the Jerk Center and Discovery Bay, there's a large lake on the left. It is the St. George's Lake. And it's a wetland. It's completely surrounded by mangroves. And the primary function it does there is to actually provide water from the town for the town of Discovery Bay. So it's very, very important for Discovery Bay. And a pear tree near the Bahia Hotel in um, St. Anne. That's a river for the community, and it's a large filtration mechanism for any um, impurities that is coming out of the hills. Some parts of the hills are brownstone, um, runner bay area. So water provision, water retention, water filtration, and then water-based habitats are some of the very important roles of the mangrove forest. So we have lost a lot of the mangrove forest. The parish of Trelawney alone has lost over 160 um, hectares of mangroves between 2005 and 2010. And here, here you see some examples of the hotels being built. So development is a, is a necessary part of any country's um, gross domestic product to make money. But of course, this development has to be sustainable. So here you see the excellent hotel and at the back of it, this, this bay here is where you find the luminous lagoon. So on the back of it, um, to, to have a balance, NEPA has not allowed them to develop on the inner parts of the Falmouth region because these mangrove forests keep the, the dinoflagellates glistening. And if we lose that mangrove forest there and the water gets polluted, then that will be a loss of over 30,000 US dollars per day to the Jamaican economy. So Palisades, Port Royal and Kingston, which the video you saw earlier, you know that Kingston is a natural harbor, I think the seventh largest natural harbor in the world. So these green areas you're looking at are actually mangroves. And on the outside, we have the sand dune ecosystem. So the Kingston Harbor and the billions of dollars it earns for the country, in some years more than tourism in case you don't know, it is actually very, very vital. So what is the value of the mangrove and the, and the other coastal forests, the sand dunes on the outside of um, Port Royal? They have a whole lot of value. I don't put a dollar value here, but you see it's nursery, fisheries, education, transport in terms of the airport being there, defense, JDF out there, research and education, UE. 
CMU out there as well. Um, and if you're going to the town, the transshipment, I highlight the transshipment because Jamaica is a huge transshipment hub. So we are a middle destination for many of the shipping destinations, especially in the American region. And we make a whole lot of money from that. So we need to recognize not only the valley of the Kingston Harbor, but the mangroves and the, the beach scrub on the outside along the Palisado Strip. So when we need to spend millions of dollars to protect the mangroves there, nobody should grumble because it make, it's making billions of dollars for us. And just to give you one example, um, this is a headline from the Jamaica Green 2017. It said, Mobe winds blow top flight cruise ship back to Kingston. So there was a day a ship was supposed to dock in Montego Bay. It never happened because it was too windy on the North Coast. So they said, hey, let's bring them to Port Royal. And that is how a lot of the Port Royal um, cruise development that is happening was re reignited because Port Royal, um, Kingston actually hosted, not Port Royal, they never had a cruise ship terminal yet. Kingston actually hosted this, this um, cruise ship, $2 million worth of value for that day, effortlessly. The only issue with the Kingston Harbor is that it is polluted, but the mangroves and the sand dune here keeps the Kingston Harbor protected, so it can make millions of dollars. The headlines never said coastal forest saves Jamaica two, saves Jamaica two million dollars, but the reality is these are the kind of things we need to highlight. So if that cruise ship didn't land that day, we would lose two million dollars. So we're very happy that we have healthy coastal ecosystems. But mangroves are threatened, and that is no um, secret to us. Globally, one of the main things that threatens mangrove is. Um, Mariculture, shrimp farming, and other types of aquaculture development. Um, we don't have a lot of that in Jamaica. We actually do have some failed shrimp ponds that, um, for example, down on the south coast of Clarendon there, um, Sodico is trying to rehabilitate. Very big project, very happy to have um, worked along them, alongside them with that project. And um, development, dumping, and all the other human comforts that we need. These, these things, these different things threaten mangrove forests. So they are account for only about 2% of Jamaica's landmass, but we have lost over 2,000 so 2, hectares of mangroves um, between 89 and 2010. So that's a whole lot of mangroves in um, a couple of decades. And we really need to slow down the mangrove loss. And there's a whole lot of talk about um, mangrove replanting and so on. But bear in mind that the mangroves we are restoring currently is just the mangroves that we have lost. For us to actually add new mangrove acreage, it will be very technical, very expensive, and I don't think we're going down that road. So the important thing is to conserve what we have, all right? I know persons get very passionate about restoration and replanting, but it's a lot, lot, it's a lot more difficult than, than it seems, especially when concrete is in the area already, which is often the case. So, we have made some progress in terms of mangrove rehabilitation in Jamaica. Um, we have a seedling bank. We have different mangrove nurseries at the Port Royal Marine Lab and the Discovery Bay Marine Lab. We have done lots of research into mangrove restoration. We are doing, helping different government agencies, NGOs to restore mangroves in their areas or to conserve mangroves in their areas. Right now we're working alongside NEPA and a private landowner to get 50 acres of mangroves in Trelawney conserved, not restored, conserved. A small portion of, portion of it will be restored. So these are the kind of things that are happening on the ground. And um, even though we have killed about 5,000 seedlings, we're happy to say that we haven't killed hundreds of thousands of seedlings over the years because one of the common problems with mangrove rehabilitation is that persons try to just plant seedlings in an area. But the important thing for mangrove restoration is hydrology, getting the water balance right. So here we have a picture of an area in Portland Cottage that we worked alongside NEPA and CCAM. And that's a picture after, um, I think, 24 months, we had a big, big increase in terms of the natural recruits. And this project was actually in threat because of goats. So we, actually, we had to fence the area to keep the goats out. So there are many challenges in mangrove restoration, not just, um, but it's, it's mostly related to people. So it's a very complicated process and we need to get it right and not waste our time and money. So check with an expert if you want to do mangrove restoration. That's the point. 
So um, out on the policy, just let me just tell you a little about, about that. So they did the restoration of the roadway. And a part of that, we had to put back them some of the mangroves that were lost in the construction phase. In the initial phase, we had very good survival for the first 12 months. The plants began to flower. Yeah, we have a fence on the outside of it and things were looking good. But what happened is that after 18 months, um, the agency that was responsible for re maintaining the area, they actually were responsible for it. We were just contractors to do it. The money paused, so we no longer had any money to clean the fence or maintain the fence. And then what happened? Here comes the fence breaking and the solid waste comes in. And there you see hundreds of pounds of garbage along the shoreline. So this is all from the Kingston Harbor. So mangrove restoration is possible, but it's not very simple and straightforward. You need to get it right. Yes, it's a waste of, so this is taxpayers money and it was halfway done, not, not fully done. And uh, the results weren't very good. So of course we have a large solid waste problem in Jamaica. So I cannot talk about mangroves and health and water without emphasizing that solid waste is a big, big issue. And as you can see, about 41% of our solid waste collected is beverage bottles. And then you have other categories, plastic bags, etc. Here we see the Palisado site, the fence, and you can see the large amount of garbage on the outside waiting to get in. The little mangrove ceilings were doing pretty well. Didn't want, to let, didn't want the fence to let them in. Sadly, it broke at some points. And here we see a crocodile with um, plastics in its mouth. And microplastics are also a big issue. So it's in our stomach now, it's in our food. So we need to do all we can to reduce the plastic load in Jamaica, both on a national level and on a personal level. And you can do it personally as well. For example, when I go to the grocery store, I try my best not to buy plastic bottles. I buy box juice, um, cans, bottles as much as possible. If I can't avoid buying the plastic, I do so, but it's a personal decision I make. And so far, so good. And if you have to buy plastic, buy in bulk. Don't buy a case of um, um, the 600 milliliter bottles. Buy a jug or buy a one gallon bottle and then the can from that daily. So you can do you have many personal things you can do to improve the plastic loads. So plastic bags are very detrimental to mangroves. And this is an experiment I did for my PhD looking at plastic bottles versus wood versus plastic bags. And even though putting the results up, you can see that the different enclosures, the different treatments, the one with plastic bags, there was literally one little mangrove seedling peeping up. The rest had died. So all of them started with the same amount of mangrove seedlings, same treatment, same soil, same water. But the one with the bags had very, very low survival. Right? The ones that had no garbage had, in some cases, 100% survival. So a clean environment gives us better environmental serv ecological services. So looking at some of the mangrove restoration we've been doing throughout the years, um, complements a forest conservation fund and other agencies. So this is a site in St. James, right along the, the highway, it was dumped up with marl from the Highway 2000. We started prudent to do a mangrove restoration there. We scraped it out, and after that, the water returned, and the seedlings naturally recruited. Sorry, I don't have a picture of it um, two years later. I should have really provided one. However, if you look at this picture, this section here with the marl is a part of 25 acres of mangroves, which is privately owned. So despite our efforts right here, if somebody decides to build a hotel right here, um, it's quite possible. Will they? We don't know. But these are the kind of things that the government needs to get ahead of if we're going to um, conserve more mangroves than we lose in the future. So these parcels of land, will they be attained by the government? Very expensive to do so, but it's not impossible. So um, another example of mangrove enhancement that was done, this is in a hurricane damage area. And studies show that hurricane damage areas will recover after about 25 or 30 years. But we didn't want to wait. We wanted to, wanted to see experimentally what would happen. So we literally went into the mangrove with a chainsaw and we cut the mangrove, the trees that had fallen down, into small bits and pieces and put them into mounds. The issue with the trees on their sides is that they stop the seedlings from circulating in the mangrove forest. So the seedlings began to circulate and within a year or two, 
I mean, they're not adult trees yet, but it's certainly doing a lot better. And I got the community involved there. And um, the NGO down there called Breads was very instrumental in making that happen. So even hurricane damage here, as you can have some mangrove rehabilitation as well um, in a sustainable way. So hydrology or the movement of water is key exactly. to the restoration of mangrove forests. Here's an example from Montego Bay, where that was, um, we scraped down the area. We planted some seedlings just experimentally. Within 12 months, they weren't looking so great. But after 24 months, when they had a little bit of the fresh water with the switch coming in, they actually were doing wonderful. So um, gray water or even water with switch in small amounts doesn't damage mangroves very badly. But of course, with everything in nature, it has what they call a carrying capacity. So you cannot exceed it past a certain level. So very happy that we added new trees in Bog to help to soak up some of the sewage that is in the mangrove forest there. But we still need to get the sewage treatment plants fixed because it could be a case where eventually it will kill the trees and the trees won't be able to protect the coral reef. So it's a very fine balance we have to, to meet. And that's a picture of the same site, but looking at an aerial photograph. At time zero, um, one zero when I started the experiment versus two years later, and you can see on the right, the mangrove forest was looking very, very plush and healthy um, as compared to two years ago. So even though the area hasn't been completely filled out, um, this area is no longer attractive to informal settlements or charcoal when it used to happen there. It's now a very wet and very functional mangrove forest. And in case you want to show you, want to be sure it's the same vantage point, just look at the tree there with the star. One black mangrove parent was there. And it's still there, it's now larger. But um, these young trees actually surpass the height of the, black, of the original parent tree there. So it goes to show that once you are damaged um, at a certain stage, you really cannot recover. And I'm not throwing any word on anybody, right? But it's very important for you to actually get um, living things in their growth stages with the best nutrition and health possible. Right, so that's the point, and even the mangroves are telling us that. So one thing to emphasize that plastic is really damning. These are four of my sites where I looked at how many of the plants are flowering, and it showed that the Palisades out in Kingston had the highest percentage of flowering, but on the right here, it had the lowest percentage of seedlings um, coming up, or recruits as we call them. Why was that? Because the solid waste essentially killed them. So, some key points or consideration, considerations for Jamaica's mangrove forests or wetlands being World Wetlands Day. And I want you to think on these points. Conservation is key to the sustainable use of our mangrove forests. So we cannot wait until they're destroyed to try to rehabilitate them. It's going to be too late. And in some cases, it's going to be impossible. So we need to be preemptive. And um, sometimes even construction projects, a badly placed culvert can kill a whole mangrove forest. I remember going down with the study eco team and showing them the road that was built to the Jackson Bay Beach. And just by putting in one culvert right there, they have reversed the, the death of, I believe, about seven or eight acres of mangrove forest down there with just one pipe. So are we learning from our previous mistakes? In many cases, we are. But I think um, we need a little bit more of the sustainable development happening. Beaches in Trelawney are under real threat because they are between St. Anne and St. James, so Trelawney is what is left after most of the North Coast is developed. So they're still making sand, so some of the reefs out there are still healthy. In fact, one of the white sand and mining beaches in Jamaica is actually found in Trelawney. So we need to make sure that we keep these areas as clean as possible and as healthy as possible. And this is through uh, many different efforts. One very important plug I'm gonna put here because I don't know who is listening, and it's something I've advocated for, and maybe I need to do it formally. Our municipal corporations, our parish councils need environmental officers. No, I, to my checks, no parish council in Jamaica has an environmental officer and staff. And still, we're coming down very heavily on NEPA for a lot of things that NEPA isn't responsible for. For example, houses. And as you can see in my earlier slide, in comparing the, the, the squatting settlements in Trelawney versus the hotels, in these informal settlements are actually um, occupying more acreage than the hotels. And even though I'm not advocating for more hotels on the coastline, 
the hotels do have a sewage treatment plant, but when you have a community of 150 households with no um, septic tank, in some cases sewage, um, some cases soak away pits, which are illegal, the parish council needs to get a handle on that because all of this water is soaking away into our mangroves, into our sea, and no wonder why we're getting more ill. And um, they do not have environmental officers, and that is something that would help to curtail some of this, in my opinion. So let's look at some of the good things that are happening. Places like Palisades Port Royal, even though it's polluted, it um, does require, it does do a lot still because it helps to keep the Kingston Harbor clean. Another one, which is a heritage site, is Civil in St. Anne. Um, it is a historical manatee site. It has um, the historical Spanish and um, structures in there. It provides filtration for the upper community and it's a beautiful spot. Um, it's a little bit underused because only horseback riding is happening there. So it may be a business opportunity waiting to be tapped into down there in Seville. Very beautiful from the area as you can see. So when you're passing from Senans Bay to Priory, you maybe have no clue that the mangroves on the outside there are so beautiful. And um, just going back to the points, the rehab works are very expensive and sometimes impossible when concrete is in place. And some developers actually are clearing the land before they apply to NEPA for the permits. So when NEPA shows up, they're like, oh, it's cleared already. So I think NEPA and the other government agencies need the, the budget and the technology to have the capabilities to stay ahead of these um, unscrupulous practices. We need better waste management solutions and we need to reduce our plastic load. And you can do that from your home level, right? Don't just wait on the government to say ban plastics, right? Wherever you go, you can reduce the amount of plastics used in your home and on the road. And in terms of these wetlands, billions of dollars are being capitalized. And we look at the example of the glistening waters, which makes more money than the prettiest coral reef in Jamaica on a daily basis. There are other years in Jamaica that we can capitalize on for ecotourism. I know now it isn't a great time for ecotourism, but it will pass. And there are many years that we can tap into. So having recently completed my PhD, um, and in a talk like this, I have to say thanks to many of the persons on the screen here um, from my department, my supervisors, volunteers who work on these mangrove projects with me, government of Jamaica employees, um, some environmental consultants, my land surveyor, Mr. Johnson Wiggins, FCF, Sanders Resorts, and I have made a fair amount of wetland mentors at our, um, as well, like the late Dr. Robin Lewis, Benjamin Brown, soon to be PhD, and my family and friends and loved ones, which are too many to name. So thank you very much, and I welcome any questions from you, and I hope the, the talk was productive and useful. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Trench. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, we saw clearly the connection between, you know, the existence of the wetlands and, you know, its connection to the disaster reduction as well as the, the industries that can spring up from it. And so it, 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 it highlighted that. And if we understood our own individual responsibilities as you have clearly stated as well, then we can do more to conserve it. Because you also mentioned the fact that it's better to prevent the destruction of our mangrove areas than to try and rehabilitate them or replant them. It's a lot more effort. So if we can do more of the conserving, then it, it, it would be better for us. Absolutely. So we want to invite persons, you know, if you have any questions, we want to, you know, hear them. I know there are some posted in the chat. I see there is a Shakyu. She asked, uh, let me see if I can bring it up. Oil drilling in Okavango is going on right now. I thought it was a Ramsar site. How are they being allowed to do that? And how can we protest that? She also oh. asked who determines the value of the reef. Okay. All right, thank you very much for that question. Um, 
Sadly, I, I guess I'm not staying abreast with that kind of news. Um, so Ramsar sites are protected on paper, but it's really down to the, the citizens of that country to protest with that government. Um, how can we protest that on a global stage? Um, we do have a Ramsar committee um, which sits with NEPA. I have not been an active member for many, many years. So Shaku, I would encourage you to get in touch with the, the guys on the Ramsar committee to see what you can do, how you can get involved with that, that issue. Um, thank you for the information about the glistening water tools. Who determines the value of the reef? Well, we do not have a national program for determining the value of any reefs or wetlands, but um, values of different reefs, reefs and wetlands have been done in different pockets. So you can actually um, commission that based on where you are and where you're working. So you can, um, there are different experts working on economic valuation. I know there's our very own Peter Edwards who works abroad, but um, he's somebody who does that. A um, couple other persons, Elizabeth Emmanuel, et cetera. So value for reefs can be derived. I am no expert on it. That is not my area of expertise, but I don't think um, NEPA has a national project to do that. So that's something you could undertake. Um, locally or through your organization. All right, there is Marceline. She's asking about those by ferry. I suspect it's the mangroves by ferry. And if we recognize the development that has been ongoing. Um, do you want to clarify that question, Marceline? Yes, that's what I'm asking. Good evening, sorry. That's what I'm asking about the mangroves in Ferry um, and the recent developments. And I'm not seeing like any mangroves being planted there. So I'm just wondering what's going to take place there. Okay. Um, for that particular development, when every development happens, once NEPA, um, I am not very aware because I don't work with NEPA, as I said. So. The person to direct that question would be to NEPA. But whenever there is mangrove damage, NEPA has a no net loss policy. So that developer would either pay money to the government for restoration work to happen elsewhere, or that developer would do a restoration project which would give back for the mangrove loss locally. Um, well, as I said, it's fair, so I'm not so sure what kind of wiggle room there is in Kingston, but in terms of that particular project, you'd have to check with NEPA to see what was done about that. I am assuming that um, the developer did some kind of um, payment for the damages to the mangrove done. So developers have the option to do a mitigation where they actually do it themselves personally and um, or pay money to the government for the damage that they did. And the government will then put this money in another area. So for example, in Falmouth, I know NEPA did a lot of work down there based on monies gotten from other damages in other parts of the country where possible mitigation wasn't um, done in that location. Thank you. Bernadette has asked, what is involved in restoring hydrology at a restoration site? Okay, well, thank you. Very good question, Bernadette. Hydrology is basically the movement of water. So the first thing you need to do is study the heck out of it to see what are the sources of water um, or originally the sources of water. Um, how do these water bodies move in and out of the area? What affects these water bodies? And then after that, you can formulate a plan in terms of putting back this water in the system, whether in the same way or in a more creative way. But the point about mangroves and wetlands is that they are wetlands, they do need water, right? And in some cases, it doesn't have to be nice, clean, fresh water. In some cases, it can be slightly tainted or gray water. As you know, the plants soak up a lot of these nutrients. For example, um, one of my pet peeves is the use of gray water. And I think in Jamaica, we don't use gray water enough. I do it personally at home where any of my family members or friends who get plantings from me can know that they, those plantings are fed from my kitchen sink and my washing machine. I don't spend a dime to irrigate them. 
So things like that can happen to irrigate a wetland. But we put a whole lot of our grey water down into the soak away pit or into the septic tank, which isn't good for it because the grease isn't good for it anyway. So I think we need to look at these from a national policy level. So I hope you, I hope I answered your question, but I guess the long and short of it, you need to study where the water sources are to understand the water sources before you can restore it. And a key part to that is the topography, not just the water, how it moves, but also the lay of the land, the slope, what is high, what is low, et cetera. Thank you for that. Um, you. Davina is asking, um, is soakaway pits illegal in all parishes? And just want to tie another question to that by, um, I think it's Mr. Harding. He asked if you could explain again, the connection between sewage and the mangrove survival, especially in the Kingston Harbor and the NWC plant in Mobe that feeds into the Bog Islands. So, okay. All right. So the first question is so far if it's in all parishes illegal? Yes. Based on our building code, it is illegal. But as you know, especially out in the country, majority of our houses were built with soak away pits. So the parish council isn't going to go and retroactively say to your grandmother who built her house from the 1950s, dig up that soak away pit and put in a septic tank. But what should happen is that when you have a new construction happening, the parish council should not only collect the building fee and not only make sure that the steelwork is good, but they should also come and check to make sure that you have a septic tank or a reed bed or some other system apart from a soak away pit. Are they doing that? I know some of the municipal corporations do it. Some of them, I know, turning a blind eye to it, right? In terms of the sewage and the mangroves, yes, mangroves do, like every other plant, absorb nutrients. But there is a particular critical level. So if the mangroves, let's say for argument's sake, you have 10 acres of mangroves that can soak up 10,000 gallons of sewage effectively, it doesn't clean it 100%. It doesn't mean that you should send more sewage there. It is better at handling the gray water where the sewage is cleaned up. It has the phosphates and the nitrates, but the bacteria load, it will not remove the bacteria from the water 100%. So it has a carrying capacity, meaning it can stay, soak up so much, but no more. So in the, Bogue, in the Bogue Lagoon area, it does reduce the pollution that goes into the, the bog swamp area, but it doesn't completely eliminate it. But the point I was trying to make, suppose it wasn't there. If it wasn't there, all those great, lovely mansions in the Bogue Lagoon area and the lovely hotel secrets and all of that, they would not want to be there, I guarantee you, because that would be nasty, um, smelly water in the lagoons of Bogue. So we need to keep the mangroves there intact. Not only there, but every other place across Jamaica, as much as possible, we need to keep them intact. Because they're Trent. very easy to lose, but very hard to bring back. Dr. Trench. Yes, sir. Yeah, just want to. Sorry, I think you're muted. I'm sorry. Aren't there significant developments taking place in the in the in the Freeport area that militates against all of what you're talking about? Well, this, the developments that happen, if they're well, to be honest with you, it's not a matter of the development; it's a matter of the treatment of the sewage related to the development. And as I we're talking about a specific development, but if the sewage systems are working properly and if they are built to scale properly, then it's less of an issue. However, I cannot tell you if they are working properly 100% and if they are up to the scale or the magnitude that they need to be. But I have seen in some cases where the sewage does spill over and the mangroves are there to soak it up. So it's something that needs a little attention, even though it's um, behind the bushes. Um, it needs a collaborative effort from not just um, the NGOs, but the government agencies. The NWST needs to make sure that its sewage treatment plant is working properly. The municipal corporation and the public health division need to ensure that there's not sewage in the drains along Howard Cook Boulevard. And in mm -hmm. some cases, there is sewage in the stormwater drain, which should not be. Is somebody tracing that stormwater drain to see where the sewage is coming from? I cannot answer that question for you, but I know that there is sewage in the mangrove forest there. 
But what about, um, if I might be um, able to, what about the situation in Kingston Harbor now? Because um, that has been a significant problem in the corporate era for years. How, how is that affecting and impacting on mangroves? Well, as you know, it is, it is affecting it very badly. And they have installed a soap water sewage treatment plant, which has helped. But I am not 100% sure if all of, the, all of Kingston isn't piped into it. So I think Kingston needs more sewage treatment. And um, in addition to the solid waste issues in Kingston as well. So it's definitely obvious that our country doesn't have enough um, sewage treatment um, facilities. So there is a great dent in it, but it's not 100% solved. Do we have the space for it? Will we prioritize the money to do it? That is a question I can't answer. Thank you. I think we just have like a minute or so for the question and answer section. Just want to say congratulations to Brighton R on winning the Wetland Games section. So Ms. Tiona Thomas, will contact you with your gift as soon as possible. All right, so way to go, Brighton. And he also has a comment and a question. After that, I will take Sharon Stimson, whose hand is up. But his comment, let me just bring it up. If mangroves are so valuable and Jamaica stands to gain so much from healthy and functioning mangroves, why aren't they better protected? I'm certain that policymakers are also aware of their value. What then is preventing governing and regulating bodies from better protecting this valuable resource? And I think you had touched on some of that in your initial um, response, responses, but can you add to any of what he's requesting or asking? Well, I'm, I'm not so sure if I can answer that question properly because I don't um, I don't work in policy and government. I know that we have made a lot of improvement over the years though. So I, I cannot knock um, a lot of the persons who are doing a lot of the good work behind the scenes, etc. cetera. But um, development has to happen. And the reality is why it's not happening at that pace that we would like to see, because the immediate dollars take precedence over the long-term dollars. That is the reality. So it is very important for us to find immediate dollars in the blue economy, in the mangroves, in the coral reefs, in the seagrass beds. And I think the more we do that, the more these air will be protected. And again, I use the glistening water as an, as an example. No, and I can't say nobody, but because of the amount of money the glistening water earns, it gets more protection now. And I know Nepal is doing a whole lot of work down there. And they have done their part to protect it from hotel development. When a developer comes and says, hey, we want to do development, um, it is really at the will of the people if they want this development to happen. And most of the persons will say, hey, we want a job. So the, the thing is, we need more jobs based on the blue economy and less jobs based on concrete. Until we get that, the mangroves will always lose to the development and the other industries. Thank you for that. Um, Sharon Stimson, you can go ahead with your question or comment. Yes, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, can hear you. Seaweed, at the Helsha, in the Helsha area, particularly the Fort Clarence Beach, sometimes when you go, you can't swim because it's so crowded with uh, seaweed. Is that because of the lack of mangroves or the, the diminished mangroves in that area? And two, the crocodiles in that area. Uh, have we done anything to increase the population and what it would be the population now? All right, well, I am no crocodile expert. Um, I actually see a colleague, colleague of mine online, um, Damian White. Uh, maybe our colleagues from Nepal can maybe type in the chat. I do not know much about the crocodile population there. Um, maybe absolutely nothing. I know crocodiles are in threat. Persons are actually eating them. So I don't think the crocodile population is really increasing. Um, it's just, just that maybe we see higher incidence of crocodiles in the rainy season when a lot of rain is happening. So it's not that there are more. It's just that we had an unusual amount of rain towards the end of last year. I was still having some now. 
So you'll see there's a, there's a perception that the crocodile population is greater. It's not, it's still in threat. In terms of the seaweed, it has nothing to do with the mangrove. That is a seaweed um, called um, sargassum, which is a global problem now. You can, you can Google it. Essentially, it blooms because of the high levels of eutrophication or pollution happening down in the Amazon region. Oh. And some of it is also um, originating in the Atlantic. So we have a, have a too much. That seaweed was always around. It's a little brown one in some little balls and in some little float. It was always around. But now it has increased by 10, 15 the amount of times because of the, the climate change, the water is warmer, so the seaweed loves that, and the water has more nutrients. So just like cabbage and pak choy, the plants bloom with nutrients. So that sargassum is a problem now. Okay. Um, there are different agencies looking at how we can use it. In fact, you, we are doing different experiments, SRC, um, doing different experiments to see how we can use it because it's washing up on the beach. Yes. Um, it's not very tasty. People have looked at it in that way, but it could be used as fertilizer, fodder, etc. So they're looking at different um, things. In fact, we did a, a, we are doing an experiment right now uh, with mangrove ceilings that show that it actually is somewhat of a good fertilizer, but it, you cannot make it get very wet. But um, it might be a while before we have that publication out. Okay, I used to but use it. Seaweed has nothing to do with the mangrove. It's really an oceanic um, um, issue. Okay, thank you for that. I use it though to feed my pet fish. Oh, yeah. fish are eating it. Yes, the pet fish, them. The, the... Oh, they like it. Oh, that's very good to know. I'll, I'll tell my, my saga some research colleagues about that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I get to understand that our colleague from UDC is here. Would you like to weigh in on the request or, or question that was also mentioned by Sharon about the crocodiles? Damien White? Or we can ask you to also respond in the chat as well. All right, so I'm just going to read our final statement or comment in the chat that was posted by Susan Davis. And she has commented that just a reminder that unlike protected areas that are legally declared uh, and there are regulations to guide their management, the Ramsar site label is only an international recognition and has no legal teeth. I'm um, just sorry wondering... about that. Okay. Sorry there, I was trying to unmute. What was the question? Okay, so she had asked a question about the crocodiles in the, I think it's the St. Catherine region and how to increase the population of them there as they are sometimes being persecuted. Um, the, the thing is just remember that initially that the, the crocodiles are protected and are managed by NEPA. And sometimes, um, stakeholders like NGOs and UDC assist um, NEPA with their work. In terms of um, the crocodiles, we are aware that um, there's a certain um, persecution going on, going on now in terms of loss of habitat, and there is now the increased um, illegal poaching, which is totally illegal where people are eating it. Um, there have been measures that NEPA can answer in terms of being implemented in terms of protecting some of the habitats are doing stuff like protecting nesting areas and also finding areas to relocate um, animals that get um, used to people feeding them or example like right now you have the mating season might get um, what I should say at this time they get a bit aggressive and the area might be located too near to a school and might have an impact and the people are, we find out that they're at risk of damaging their stuff. So um, in terms of what, uh, what is being done with some of the stakeholders now, um, there's um, like increase in monitoring in some areas where, where we have people feeding the crocodiles, like the popular, instead of catching, there's a popular bridge at Tulsa that has been um, monitored more by a UDC team. And for example, like at some of the sewage fund, other agencies like 
um, through NEPA or NWC where they are putting fencing to deal with the issue. The last part now in terms of um, setting up breeding program that's a touchy issue. We have a, um, a way of sanctuary that we, that for now is like a Head Start program where if you have trouble net, they would carry it over to Allen Bay and some other groups like Swamp, Safari, or the guys on St. Elizabeth, Mr. Swaby. But there is not a big scale Head Start program which is similar um, to the Jamaica Iguana. However, in the future, if we find out that the numbers are getting too low, initiative like that will be put in, where everybody aware Head Start to keep the actions for a while until they can be released in the wild. But for now, it's just protecting nesting area, some of the habitat where we know that poaching is a problem and where there's conflict with development. I hope that answers your question. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, do you know what, I uh, have any idea of the population there in Helsha of the, the crocodiles that is? Uh, um, 151. <laughs> Well, NEPA is currently, uh, which that, um, Chair Pickling from NEPA is currently doing an island survey of the crocodiles and will later can answer such questions. But what I can say, Helsha is one of the areas that we find currently that we have the highest density of crocodiles in the island in terms of large animals. And surprisingly, because of um, historically, we have been doing a lot of the development in the wetland. This has forced the crocodiles to use um, the sewage pond, treatment pond, as available habitat because that way they can find birds and all sorts of stuff. So it has the highest density in um, Jamaica. And just remember that the wetlands are decreasing because people chopping down the mangroves, some of them eat people use it um, to cook the fish that everybody body by a Telsa beach. Some are charcoal burning, some are just people putting in development and cutting out. So all of that having an impact on the top predator like crocodiles, which are very important for the wetland. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, future Dr. White. We appear to have lost the host. If, if Tiona would like to take over as co host. Thank you. I'm experiencing a little technical difficulty. I'm Tiona Thomas, if you could read the comment on the Susan Davis and then we continue.
I am just apologizing for the break. I, my computer just lost uh, Sean, and so I'm, I'm just trying to re reboot it. So I am not privy to the, the chat. Is Susan Davis online? Hello, Eartha, I'm right here. Are you able to hear me? Is anybody else hearing me? Yes. Yes, yes I'm hearing you. Yes, we are okay. hearing you. We're here, we're hearing you. Right. Yes, I'm, I'm going to help you with Eartha. Um, I think she was, she was heading you. Yes, no problem, Eartha. I think you are you are wrapping up, and you had wanted to just extend thanks to Dr. Trench. So, just in light of the the technical difficulty, I'm just going to help out and just extend thanks to Dr. Camelia Trench for the very informative and interesting presentation. I think it's safe to say that everybody appreciated it, and we all learned something new. Um, I know myself; I've been very interested in mangrove ecology for many years, but I still learned new things in your presentation. And we look forward to further collaboration between your institution and the Natural History Museum of Jamaica, Institute of Jamaica. So thanks again, Dr. Trench. And everybody, thank you for joining us in this, our first feature. And we look forward to you joining us on the other planned presentations that Eartha mentioned earlier. Enjoy the rest of your World Wetlands Day. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for, okay, for you. that. Yes. And so we have come to the end, actually, of our time here spent. And we just want to thank everyone for their company. Um, we had one more short one minute presentation, but we're not able to share it, but we we'll post it online for persons to view on our social media platform. And so we, we just hope that persons will join us again next week. So we have, we, have, we have come to the end of our presentation. So we are asking persons to just look out for our upcoming events. These will be posted on our social media platform.